All right, able to see it? Yep. All right, cool beans. So this is a interesting case that I saw with Dr. Massey over at the VA. Um, go ahead and get started here. So it's a 63-year-old male presented to the ER with multiple days of right hemibody numbness and woke that AM with new onset aphasia, and he was stroke coded upon arrival. History is a little bit convoluted, but to keep it as concise as possible, three weeks prior, he had an episode where he awoke with blood in his mouth and all over the pillow. He bit his tongue, went to an outside ER, uh, CT and EEG were without acute features. Uh, they didn't do any specific interventions. He was discharged home. Several days later, he awoke with right body numbness that kind of waxed and waned ever since onset, never went away, uh, didn't seek any evaluation at that point in time. Uh, and then a few days prior to arrival, he awoke with diffuse facial and eye swelling along with a bump on his left forehead went to an outside ed again at that point ct sinuses showed diffuse sinusitis uh, wasn't sure if he was given antibiotics but they gave him steroids and it resolved all the swelling except for the bump on his forehead and then the morning of presentation the new onset aphasia so his exam notable for a soft mass like structure on the forehead without any ecchymosis or underlying like erythema going on it wasn't painful to palpation uh, speech notable for receptive, worse than expressive aphasia. Mostly can kind of get through naming and repeating, but required providers to talk slowly to him for him to understand. A little bit of dysarthria. Had slight, subtle right nasolabial flattening. Um, and then otherwise on his motor exam, he only had just a chronic left foot droop from a back surgery. No other significant features. Sensory, reduced light touch and pinprick on the right. No extinction. Uh, initial impressions is kind of looking at him. Uh, I was a little bit kind of confused, you know, is this repeat stroke events or a focal small hemorrhagic conversion of maybe some kind of left temporal parietal focus, or is he having some kind of new focal epilepsy driving of unclear etiology? He had this bump on his forehead. I was wondering, could it be a hematoma? Did he hit his head? He had a, a, a wall next to his bed, or, you know, is there something infectious going on with this sinusitis kind of picture, this bump that pops up? Although at that point, wasn't toxic looking, a fever and had been going on for weeks, so a little bit bizarre for me. So going into imaging, got a CT scan for him, which uh, interesting features coming up here as we're scrolling through. Uh, he has this pocket that'll come up here on the left that you can see kind of looks subdurally, epidurally kind of in nature that caught radiology's attention and mine as well. And then they said there's another spot right here where it looks like there's a hyper dense vessel going on right here. You can also see this bump that I was talking about on his forehead up here subcutaneously. Uh, and so radiology's initial impressions was, you know, could this be something possibly veno occlusive? Not really sure. And so got CT angio as the next step for him. And I'll just keep it short that where the most prominent feature you could see is in the posterior sagittal sinus right here. You can see uh, some veno occlusive burden in there. It'll kind of teeter and totter kind of right in there. So that was probably the most notable feature with that study. So ended up getting an MRI for him. Here's the flare. You can see he's got a lot of sinusitis burden going on up here. And the frontal is pretty much pan sinusitis. Here's the subcutaneous bump he's got going on here. And you can see some changes around here where that pocket was. So flare, not the most giveaway. Diffusion restriction, of course, sin you know, sinuses light up. Um, he'll also have some lighting up here of this area and lighting up of this pocket up here. And he ended up having a tiny little stroke uh, on that side. And that's kind of that in a nutshell. And then I will skip over to the contrasted study which I think, so you see contrast all through the sinuses, contrast up here, contrast along this pocket, and then pretty much all of the meninges just along this side light up and especially kind of coming up in here, you can see as well. And so inevitably he was diagnosed with what's called POTS puffy tumor, which is kind of a misnomer, but essentially uh, it is a complication of rhinosinusitis disease that's gone on for too long. He ended up getting osteomyelitis, a subperiosteal abscess, abscess, and that pocket that you saw on the left side actually ended up being an empyema. Uh, and he, associated with that, he had venoocclusive disease secondary to infection. And so he was inevitably transferred from the VA 
NBA over to Duke, uh, ended up undergoing a left uh, parietal craniotomy and pyema evacuation. And ENT also came in and opened up a lot of his sinuses to help with drainage. Uh, ended up isolating strep viridens. Uh, he uh, actually ended up recovering relatively well uh, and was discharged home on IV ceftriaxone and PO flagell for a couple of weeks. And so I just kind of want to put kind of just a, a picture here of, of a schematic of what POTS puffy tumor can look like. You have the, the sinusitis going on. You can get the osteomyelitis, the subperiosteal abscess, and then you can get the empyema formation just below the bone. And here, picture looks relatively the same. He's got the subperiosteal abscess, and then you can also see all of this inflammation track along here. It just so happened that he developed the empyema over on this side. So that's my case. Thank you, Ben. So uh, let me take over. Let me see if I can, there you go. I got it. Okay. All right, so uh, we're really pleased to have uh, Dr. Dorlin Kimbrough uh, do Grand Rounds. Dorlin is one of our, our newest faculty members. He got his MD at Vanderbilt, residency at, at New York University, and then did his neuroimmunology fellowship at uh, Johns Hopkins. Started his career at the Brigham, and then we were lucky to get him down to Duke. Uh, Dorlin is an interesting guy. Uh, he was originally interested in psychiatry, uh, but then switched to uh, neurology. I wonder what percent of uh, neurologists start out with a psychiatric bent. Uh, certainly not me. Um, but in addition, he also has an engineering background. And I don't know too many psychiatrists with an engineering background. Maybe Kaf Draja uh, comes to mind, but, uh, but otherwise not too many. Uh, he loved neuroimmunology, both because the cases were very challenging and because there was a, often a huge reward uh, at the end of the uh, challenge, uh, unlike in many of the other diseases that we see. Um, Dorland's been a, you know, a star on the inpatient service as well as the outpatient service, and we're thrilled uh, to have him with us and speaking to us today on disease modifying therapies for neuromyelitis optica. So Dorlin, I'll throw it to you. All right, thank you, Rich. Uh, appreciate the kind introduction and uh, nice case, Ben. Let me uh, uh, pull up the, let's see here, share the screen here. There you go. All right, Working. can you see my desktop here? Yep, yep. All right, you should see the full screen with all the, with the slide, title slide. Looking good. All right, great. So uh, um, thanks again for the kind introduction. Um, I appreciate the warm welcome to Duke. Um, it's sort of a, a homecoming in a way. I went to undergrad here many years ago and I've uh, been back for just under a year now um, after moving during the pandemic last summer. And that means that uh, although some of us have met in person socially or um, on the wards or in the clinic, um, I still have never been to a grand rounds here in person yet. So hopefully with our, uh, our vaccinations and uh, at least within the hospital, um, we can do that uh, later on this fall. All right, so I'm gonna be talking about disease modifying therapies for neuromyelitis optica. And we all take care of uh, general neurology patients in the inpatient setting, but our different divisions are so specialized that I bet at least a few people in the audience probably heard that and thought, wait a minute, there's disease modifying therapy for NMO already? And uh, the answer is a happy yes, uh, that there's three new FDA approved treatments for NMO and they've all become available um, just in time around uh, 2019 before the pandemic hit would have uh, interrupted a lot of the, um, the work related to that. Um, but it's been a really a landmark for CNS autoimmune diseases um, because knowledge uh, for NMO has accelerated from basically clinical descriptions for 200 years to an antibody discovery in 2004 and effective empiric treatment shortly after that. And then disease modifying therapy approved by regulatory agencies about 15 years later. So NMO has really gone from the backwaters of neuroimmunology to being a real success story um, over these last 20 years. And I'm gonna be providing an overview of some of the treatments along with some historical context. So I'll start uh, with this intro to a review article um, from back in 1999 on neurological conditions 
And this is usually a quote that I show to other departments like internal medicine or rheumatology if I give talks over there. And uh, I think we all know and share some of the common themes of personality traits for neurologists like uh, being intellectual or knowing brain anatomy that other people are happy to forget and diagnosing rare and interesting conditions. But um, many of the other stereotypes are falling by the wayside and those old jokes about us not treating anything have been outdated for a really long time as obviously this audience knows. So after this talk, um, the goal is for you to understand the structure and function of um, uh, aquaporin-4 and its anatomic distribution as it relates to uh, neuromyelitis optica. Uh, we'll talk about the historical arc from the clinical descriptions of Dedick's disease to the current therapies uh, with a little bit more insight into why it's called Dedick's disease. And uh, also basically just to understand the um, uh, mechanisms of NMO disease modifying therapies. So part one, let's uh, um, uh, talk about uh, aquaporin-4 here, just to get us all on the same page. Um, so NMO is an autoimmune mediated inflammatory relapsing condition of the CNS, most often manifest by optic neuritis and transverse myelitis. Uh, you'll hear me make a lot of comparisons to multiple sclerosis because that's the most common such autoimmune CNS disease. And for decades, NMO was essentially described as a severe form of MS before um, we figured out that it's a totally different disease. The prevalence is about one to four per 100,000 individuals, at least in the US and Europe, uh, but that's significantly higher in East Asia, West Africa, and in the Caribbean. So for example, on Martinique in the Caribbean, it's more than double that at about 10 per 100,000 which is still rare, generally speaking, compared to multiple sclerosis, which is in the 300s per 100,000. So one teaching point for residents and fellows is that even though NMO is rare in general, uh, that's using a denominator of basically the population at large. But when you're looking at referrals to neurology clinics, your denominator really isn't the whole population. It's the much smaller number of people that are referred for a clinical complaint like optic neuritis or transverse myelitis and so like any specialized field, just because it's a rare disease doesn't mean that you'll only rarely see it. The sex ratio is uh, about nine to one female to male, which is higher than MS, where it's more like two or three to one. And the median onset age is about 10 years older than MS. So it's about 39 or 40 for NMO and about uh, 29 or 30 for MS. And again, NMO is distinct from MS. You'll hear me harping on that throughout the talk. And the major distinction is the relevance of the aquaporin-4 uh, antibody association. So for practical purposes, uh, the basic knowledge of NMO for the general neurology um, work is uh, basically to think about it in the differential diagnosis of optic neuritis or transverse myelitis. Start steroids, uh, start plex, uh, try to reduce the inflammation like we would in MS. And if the antibody test comes back positive, then there's your diagnosis. Um, and at that point, you just send them on over to neuro, send them on over to neuroimmunology, or maybe arrange a rituximab for them. So part of what I want to do in this talk is to give some context for the rationale behind the disease modifying therapies, and also to broaden the perspective of the clinical manifestations of NMO. And so for that, we'll talk about aquaporin four in some detail here. So. This image shows a tetramer of aquaporin-4. Uh, you can make out roughly four rings there symmetrically. And uh, in general, aquaporin-4, uh, aquaporins are a family of water channels regulating um, transport in most organs, including the kidney, the lungs, uh, secretory glands, uh, muscle, and the GI tract, along with the CNS. There's 12 members uh, in mammalian cells, at least. And uh, here we're concerned with number four. Um, Peter Ager at uh, Hopkins uh, back in 2003 won a Nobel Prize for work leading to the discovery of the aquaporins. And as it turns out, um, the landmark paper showing the association of aquaporin-4 with NMO was published just a year later in 2004. So aquaporin-4 is the main one of those aquaporins that's in the brain and spinal cord with dense expression in perivascular and uh, uh, subpeal spaces. So here's a 2D rendering uh, showing the two major isoforms. There's M1 and M23. 
These are named from the translation initiation sites, the thionine one or 23. And 23 is the shorter version. Uh, these two isoforms are present in all the aquaporin-4 expressing cells and of particular interest to us would be um, the aquaporin that's expressed on the astrocyte foot processes, and I'll talk about that more in a moment. So these are just the 2D schematics, um, each one showing an aquaporin-4 monomer with these six helical membrane spanning domains and the two short helical segments, and they surround a narrow pore for water transport. Um, you can imagine this in 3D by, if you were to sort of roll this page into a cylinder from left to right or right to left either way, um, uh, then you'd have sort of a tube that the water would be transported through. And uh, these monomers associate into tetramers like I showed on the previous slide or shown again here. I think I shared my desktop and not just the, uh, that window there. So you should be able to see a, a protein structure page here. Yep, yep, there. So we'll make that large. So here again, sort of looking down onto these four units here, um, you get a sense of the four pores created in each monomer and also the central pore formed by the larger complex. And also again, just in terms of 3D, uh, you can sort of see, uh, imagine those monomers sort of curled around each other. And you can see, for example, there's one uh, of these um, uh, domains that doesn't span the membrane, but the other, to expand the whole membrane. So uh, this is uh, one tetramer of the uh, uh, of aquaporin-4. We'll go back to the larger screen here. So furthermore, those tetramers will aggregate and form larger structures that, that are sort of like tessellations. Um, you can see that in panel B here. Um, and these are called orthogonal arrays of particles. And aquaporin-4 is the principal component of these. They also, they're also called OAPs. And these OAPs are the targets of the IgG antibodies to aquaporin-4. So the M23 isoform facilitates the, the OAP formation and the ratio of M23 to M1 uh, determines the size and the number of the OAP structures. And it turns out that the CNS tissues often have abundant M23 expression Therefore, they have more OAPs. Therefore, um, uh, they're more of a target for the uh, uh, aquaporin-4 IgG. And so these sorts of tissues at brain CSF interfaces are more susceptible to aquaporin-4 IgG mediated damage. So uh, binding to the OAPs causes complement dependent cytotoxicity or antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity and we can begin to see some rational targets for the drugs. Uh, this slide is pretty busy. It shows lots of uh, different drugs, some of which were in development or theoretically posed as uh, treatments for um, uh, NMO. But in general, um, let's consider the complement mediated damage to be the tip of the spear, so to speak. Um, so blunting that could reduce the pathological effects of the inflammatory response. And also just to continue that analogy, uh, the antibody mediated dam damage is, let's say, what, the shaft of that spear. So if you slow or diminish antibody production, there won't be as many uh, around to incite antibody dependent um, cell damage. And uh, just to squeeze the last bit out of that analogy, maybe the, the interleukins that are driving lymphocyte proliferation, especially uh, from plasmoblasts to uh, plasma cells, um, that, all, that mechanism also has relevance. And I'll talk about that in the context of the three new NMO treatments coming up soon. Um, so one mechanism was complement inhibition. Uh, another one is IL-6 antagonism. And lastly, there, there's a B cell depletion. So I wanna go back to uh, the, this issue of there being 12 mammalian aquaporins because that raises some interesting questions here. Um, these aquaporins are all over the place. Um, they're located in places like the uh, basal lateral membranes of epithelial cells of the kidneys. Uh, they're located in the GI tract, in the airways, and in muscles. So in that case, why don't we see several different aquaporinopathies if we can just continue to make up words here a bit. So there's aquaporin-4 in the kidney. Um, why don't we see aquaporin-4 in nephritis or something like that? The working hypotheses are that for one, um, like I mentioned just a moment ago, there's different distributions of those M1 and M23 isoforms. And so that may affect the distribution of those orthogonal arrays that are the major target uh, for aquaporin-4 antibodies. And secondly, perhaps more importantly, 
Most peripheral organs have membrane bound complement regulators. Um, they have names like CD46 and CD55 and CD59 for those of you that are in the lab. And uh, those protect organs from complement basically drilling holes in them, which is something that you wanna have. Also remember that the blood brain barrier is supposed to keep you immunologically secure, uh, which is great, but there are weak points in that defense as we know like ventricular or ependymal spaces like the area postrema. And uh, I'll also just mention here that aquaporin-4 antibodies are peripherally produced, uh, not intrathecally. So the idea is that CNS entry is through those weak points um, like the area postrema or when there's a disruption of the blood brain barrier. So um, by the way, that lack of intrathecal antibody production is also the reason why oligoclonal band testing has less utility for NMO than it does for MS, um, where there is intrathecal synthesis most times. Um, I'll also say here that the uh, aquaporin-4 cell-based assay testing in the serum is about 75% sensitive, almost 100% specific, and generally it's more reliable than CSF testing. Um, so the diagnostic utility um, is there, but the titers aren't necessarily useful for tracking the clinical severity over time. So you don't need to follow the titers necessarily once you have a diagnosis. Um, I said it was about 75% sensitive. So of that, let's say 20 to 25% that are seronegative, about a third of those patients will have what we call MOG antibodies for myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein. Um, that's a, a whole other talk these days, um, as that condition is also sort of taking off um, in terms of research. Um, and the remainder of those seronegative patients, um, these days they're essentially classified as seronegative MMO, unless there's a better clinical explanation. And um, uh, as we get into the history of this a bit later, I'm sure we'll see some uh, um, parallels with how different diseases get carved out of entities that they were once lumped into. So uh, before we get to some history here, I just showed this uh, sequence of MRIs or several MRIs here from different patients. Um, I mentioned that aquaporin-4 is highly expressed in areas where there's particularly vulnerable interfaces between the brain and the CSF. And this slide shows some of those regions, um, which are predominantly periependymal or periventricular. Uh, so around the third and fourth ventricles and area postrema, uh, and also around the hypothalamus and the diencephalon in general. All right, so um, now that we have some context about uh, aquaporin-4, and that's sort of the exciting uh, linchpin of um, uh, getting us toward a, a firm diagnosis now and having more um, basis to come up with these rational drug targets, we'll talk a little bit about the origins of NMO. So uh, here, uh, this is a, a neighborhood in the city of uh, Lyon in France called uh, Croix. I apologize for those of you that actually speak French, as I probably mangled that pronunciation, but um, uh, the picture on the right, I may have taken that picture, I'm not sure, but this is the, uh, this is the Croix Hospital there. There was a conference, um, an MS conference there several years ago. And then in the bottom right panel, there's, um, again, another pronunciation I'll mess up here, but it's called the Hotel Dieu. This was also a, um, a hospital in Lyon, and uh, uh, I think almost a thousand years ago, it was a place where popes would meet and has a lot of historical context. But the reason I bring these places up is that this was the place where uh, Eugene Devick um, came into the picture. Um, he finished his medical training uh, in 1892. Um, he was appointed to both of these hospitals. And uh, in October of 1894, um, wrote a case report of uh, acute um, uh, neuromyelitis optica. Um, here's the case report in French. We'll get into this uh, in a moment here. But uh, he published this report uh, in, uh, at the end of October in 1894. And following that, um, his student, um, essentially that uh, right around the same time, November of 1894, published his doctoral thesis where uh, he did a literature review and uh, um, pathologic analysis of that case. Uh, so he went on to become a military physician and didn't do any work in NMO. He actually worked in ENT after that. Um, but uh, these two figures are credited um, largely with uh, um, bringing uh, NMO, as it were, into the public, uh, or at least the medical consciousness then. So his case was a 45-year-old woman with headache, depression, bilateral optic neuritis, acute transverse myelitis, and this was widely recognized as the most significant early report. 
but it definitely was not the first report. So there's a Sir Thomas Albert um, who has the most uh, uh, degrees and uh, abbreviations I've seen after a name. Um, uh, this uh, gentleman was um, known mostly for the clinical thermometer and ophthalmoscopy, but included in um, one of his uh, papers about ophthalmoscopy, he noted a patient with acute myelitis and a so-called sympathetic eye disorder. Uh, that was in 1870. And there are more details that were placed in uh, an appendix to another paper that he wrote. So this case was a 26 year old man who was admitted in 1866, um, who essentially had uh, myelitis and uh, optic atrophy or optic neuropathy. And he was under observation for several months into the next year, but then lost a follow up. And there were also a couple of other cases that were noted in his notes. Um, there was uh, another patient with, again, um, the classic uh, transverse myelitis, optic atrophy. Um, they speculated that there was a response to so-called uh, ferritization and potassium iodide, but as we know, uh, with relapsing neurologic conditions, um, uh, inflammatory autoimmune conditions, typically patients will have some uh, cooling off of that, um, regardless of whether they get treatment or not. And the second case was a young woman uh, who also had a, who had left hemiplegia and recurrent blindness that happened uh, shortly after pregnancies. Um, this sounds a bit more like uh, multiple sclerosis, but again, you know, this just depends on context and a little bit of hindsight here. So there were even earlier cases than that. We can go all the way back to 1804. Um, uh, the, the general theme again is uh, some sort of visual deficit and some sort of spinal cord inflammation uh, presumed. So um, there really were uh, many descriptions of this well before DeVick uh, published his uh, case report in 1894. So that begs the question, why was it named DeVick's disease then? So uh, this physician, uh, uh, Dr. Akiyoti, again, uh, another pronunciation I may not have right there, but he um, uh, was a Turkish physician who studied in Paris and was going to present a case report of his own at the Paris um, uh, Neurological Society meeting in 1907. Um, so 25-year-old woman, bilateral optic neuritis, um, paraparesis, and sphincter dysfunction. Uh, in his paper, he proposed calling it the malady of de Vick or de Vick's disease. Uh, and he couldn't make the conference, so he asked his colleague, who happened to be Joseph Babinski, to present the paper for him. And so uh, that paper got presented, and from there, it just became known by the eponym uh, de Vick's disease. And my screen is frozen. Let's try this. There we go. Okay. All right, so let's uh, look at distinguishing this from MS here. So in 1894, again, De Vick and Galt uh, stated that NMO lesions did not uh, take the appearance of those seen in multiple sclerosis. But 30 years later, um, Russell Brain, and uh, uh, I double checked this to make sure it wasn't Russell Bryan in a typo, but it does say Russell Brain. So Dr. Brain in a review stated that the clinical and pathological differences between NMO and disseminated sclerosis appear to, appear to be differences of acuteness and intensity only. And there seems to be no justification for separating them. And that paper influenced uh, the entrenched but controversial view that uh, NMO was a subtype of MS. And that view basically stuck around for uh, the rest of the century. So in 1999, there were proposed diagnostic criteria looking at um, some of the classic clinical features like uh, optic neuritis and um, uh, transverse myelitis without any other um, symptoms that would suggest that uh, it's um, in other areas of the nervous system. Um, and also to distinguish it from MS, there was a big emphasis on a negative brain MRI, having a longitudinally extensive spinal cord lesion um, and uh, or CSF pleocytosis. So this was at the, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm laughing because it's weird to call this the turn of the century now, but 1999 apparently was the turn of the century. Just five years later, um, this is the landmark paper from uh, Mayo Clinic um, from Dr. Lennon, uh, identifying uh, aquaporin-4 as a serum autoantibody auto marker for NMO. And after this, 
we were really able to drill down and to distinguish um, true cases of NMO from those that might have been so-called aggressive MS. In 2006, uh, the uh, NMO IgG got promptly added to the diagnostic criteria. And in 2007, it became, uh, it ha had become increasingly recognized that there were a lot of other conditions that seemed to overlap with NMO. Um, so for example, there would be cases where patients would have Sjogren's syndrome or, or lupus um, or there are other um, uh, parts of uh, systemic autoimmune diseases, but would also have longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis. And so rather than just focusing on the very classic NMO presentations of optic neuritis and uh, transverse myelitis, there was a, a, a bit of expansion to include the, a full spectrum of other conditions that might have pieces of this and not necessarily the whole thing. And then just a decade ago, uh, there began to be meetings to start incorporating not just the, the classic symptoms that we talked about, the neuritis, optic neuritis and myelitis, but also some of these other brainstem syndromes. And this goes back to the first part of the lecture when I was mentioning the areas that have um, uh, sensitive brain and CSF interfaces. So the area of Hostrema syndrome, other brainstem syndromes, um, diencephalic syndromes, remember we talked about the hypothalamus, thalamus as being um, vulnerable areas too. Um, basically the, the core characteristics were expanded to not just include optic neuritis and acute myelitis. And so therefore the diagnosis depended on aquaporin-4 status in association with core characteristics. Oh, and before I, I get to that, just um, the, the highlights in orange here, these are the most common three of the six core characteristics. But it's uh, broken down by whether you're aquaporin-4 positive or negative. So if you're positive, uh, you really only need one core characteristic and no better explanation. Versus if it's negative, then to bolster the diagnosis, you need to have at least two core characteristics with one of them being um, one of the most common uh, versions, uh, such as the optic neuritis, op transverse myelitis, or area plus stream syndrome. All right, and with that, we'll move on to the disease modifying therapies here. And through the late 1990s into the early 2000s, um, immunomodulatory and immunosuppressant treatments like rituximab, mycophenolate, azathioprine and just uh, plain old oral prednisone were used empirically in small studies. And those showed reasonable efficacy data, but there weren't any randomized trials to bolster the, their uh, level of evidence. So the three new agents, uh, eculizumab, satralizumab, and inobolizumab all have randomized trials now supporting their use. And these are the ones we're gonna talk about in turn soon. So I'll, I'll just briefly mention here that the mainstay of NMO treatment during roughly the last 15 years was rituximab. Um, that's at least at academic medical centers and places that have the facilities and um, patients with sufficient resources to utilize that. Um, that's based on several small studies from the US, Germany, and Korea. And there was efficacy showed in cohorts of eight to 30 patients. Uh, azathioprine is more commonly available and easily used in many other parts of the world. So there were also several trials showing efficacy for it as well. And mycophenolate was used uh, perhaps a second or third line, mostly in competition with azathioprine, uh, depending on where you live. And uh, lastly, uh, uh, plain uh, prednisone was frequently used in Japanese centers, although that eventually gave way to rituximab. Uh, Mutazantron was studied as well, and uh, I often forget that uh, it's technically a disease-modifying therapy for MS, but no one uses that due to its side effect of cardiomyopathy. So here we are at the new therapies. Uh, from earlier, we, we know now about the uh, rational drug targets for NMO therapies because we saw that, um, just to repeat this again, the aquaporin-4 monomers associated into tetramers, then to these orthogonal arrays, um, which are located on astrocyte quick processes or at ependymal cells, um, which can be a brain CSF interfaces or in the retina. And peripherally generated antibodies will bind uh, these arrays that lead to complement or antibody dependent cytotoxicity. And then once that happens, there's this widespread injury 
destruction of astrocytes, and the surrounding gray and white matter. So uh, looking at the mechanisms, that makes sense here that we have complement inhibition by eculizumab, IL-6 um, receptor antagonism by satralizumab, uh, since IL-6 is responsible for stimulating plasmablasts to become aquaporin-4 antibody secreting plasma cells. And CD19 targeting is essentially like rituximab, uh, targeting, uh, which rituximab targets CD20, but both are B-cell depleting agents. So this is a schematic of the four trials that were done. Uh, a common theme for each of them is that they use the time to a relapse as the primary endpoint because disability in NMO is driven by clinical attacks, whereas for MS, uh, disability is driven both by attacks and by insidious progression. Um, right now, there really isn't an entity that we call, for example, a progressive NMO, although there is some debate about that, but um, essentially the, the disability is driven by attacks, so that's what was looked at here. Uh, the PREVENT trial at the top for eculizumab included only patients with seropositive NMO. Uh, they had recent relapses, and uh, during the two-year randomized control period, study arms were either eculizumab plus their baseline immunosuppressant treatment or placebo plus their baseline immunosuppressant. And uh, both those arms were followed by an open label period. So satralizumab has the two trials that are in the middle in gray here. Uh, this included both seropositive and seronegative patients. The Sakura Sky study included pediatric patients too, and all of these patients had to have recent relapses. And during the two-year randomized control period, the study arms included uh, the drug or placebo plus the patient's baseline immunosuppression. And this was followed by an open label period. The Sakura STAR study did not include baseline immunosuppression, so it was just satralizumab versus pure placebo with the randomized control period for only uh, one year. So um, one thing that was controversial about this trial is that uh, there, was, there were placebo arms and we know that the relapses that are caused by NMO tend to be more um, disabling than those for MS. So um, for those trials that had a pure placebo, the um, monitoring period, or at least the uh, uh, the study period was uh, a bit shorter than these two-year periods, um, like for eculizumab. So lastly here, the inabilizumab trial for the CD19 antagonist. Um, there were also both seronegative and seropositive patients. They all had recent relapses, and the comparison was between the drug and pure placebo, again here for the, the shortest randomized period of 28 weeks, uh, and that was also followed by an open label period. So here we have the uh, um, basic demographics of the various studies. Uh, it's a busy slide here, but um, uh, it's enough to see the basic breakdown. So uh, the seropositive patients included everyone in the eculizumab study, like I mentioned, and over 90% of the patients in the inabilizumab trial at the far right, uh, but it was just in the high 60% for satralizumab. And there were mostly women with mean age in the 40s, uh, who had initial presentations in their late 30s. Um, this, uh, in the middle, you'll see the baseline EDSS that stands for Expanded Disability Status Scale. And we use that both in MS and NMO uh, uh, to measure disability. Basically, uh, the scale goes from zero to 10, where zero is normal, 10 is death, and right around six patients need to use a walking aid such as a cane um, or have difficulty uh, ambulating. Right around four is considered moderate disability, and you can see that here for this uh, patient population. And also there's a baseline, um, this is baseline ARR, this is the annualized relapse rate. So these patients were having between one and two attacks per year um, when the studies began. So I'll say a word here about the uh, um, immunosuppressant used as the patient's baseline treatment. Um, again, it was really controversial to allow some pure placebo arms, um, so patients were allowed to continue their uh, uh, baseline treatment in some cases. And the most common ones were azathioprine, mycophenolate, and steroids, uh, though with eculizumab, rituximab was not permitted uh, because the mechanisms conflict with each other. It turns out that uh, rituximab uses complement-dependent uh, uh, cytotoxicity, 
Um, so therefore, if you have a complement inhibitor, that would have interfered with that. So here we have the primary outcome for eculizumab, um, which really shows a striking success here um, with over 95% of patients, both during the randomized control period and throughout the open label period being free from relapses versus relatively quick drop-offs to 63 and eventually 45% for placebo, um, which you'll recall also allowed their uh, baseline immunosuppression to continue there. And uh, these two curves uh, show the separate effects of that additive immunosuppressant therapy. So the eculizumab efficacy was high in both, uh, but you'll see that by the time the patients were in the open label period, only about 20% of the patients without the added immunosuppression were relapse free, whereas just over half the patients with some form of immunosuppression were uh, relapse free. So the immunosuppression was helpful, but not necessarily sufficient to keep the relapses in check. All right, here we have the curves for the Sakura study. This is satralizumab. Again, this is the IL-6 receptor antagonist, um, including both seropositive and seronegative patients, um, and also some teenagers in this population too. So the overall efficacy seems a little bit diluted um, in the graph on the left, um, the, the total population, um, because that includes some seronegative patients, uh, and the relapse-free proportion was uh, about 78% after two years, while it was over 90% for the seropositive patients alone. And here we have a uh, Secura star. Again, this is um, uh, similar, but this is uh, seronegative and seropositive, relapse-free proportion in the low 70s at about two, year, two years out. And then uh, another curve here for inobolizumab. So, uh, it, this is the CD19 uh, B cell depleter with its trial shown that uh, about 12% of the patients had relapses uh, versus nearly 40% that were on placebo uh, with a number needed to treat of uh, 3.7, which is pretty good. And uh, these numbers were similar, but slightly better in the seropositive population. Um, so 11.2 versus 42.3% um, with a number needed to treat still just around three patients. So there were lots of uh, secondary outcomes looked at here. Um, some of them are listed in this slide. Um, the big picture without going into the details for each one of these numbers is that relapse rates and disability measures were evaluated and there are major improvements in the relapse rates and modest improvements in the disability scores. Um, those of you that uh, do MS uh, will know that uh, we often use the annualized relapse rate as the primary outcome in the MS trials, but that wasn't really considered ethical for the NMO trials because since a relapse can be devastating by itself, uh, they just wanted to have the time to the relapse be the primary outcome. But uh, going along with that, it makes sense that the uh, annualized relapse rate uh, when you do the math was also reduced here. And then for adverse events in eculizumab, the most concerning issue is infection. Uh, most of the infections were uh, mild upper respiratory infections uh, with the next most common adverse events being headache and nasopharyngitis. I should mention that the headaches were not uh, meningitis associated, and the one death in the trial was associated with an infected pleural effusion that was thought to be probably related to the study drug. That brings up another point that it's really critically important to have patients be vaccinated, um, especially against uh, encapsulated organisms. And, uh, so, for example, for men meningococcus, um, because of the uh, uh, risk incurred by the uh, complement inhibition. And uh, let's see here, last we have uh, anabolizumab. Most common events for this CD19 inhibitor were UTI, arthralgia, and infusion reactions. No serious adverse events experienced by more than one patient in either the treatment or the placebo groups here. So this one turned out uh, pretty well. Uh, and uh, satralizumab here. So again, Similar, uh, the most common issue is infections, most commonly nasopharyngitis or URIs, no deaths in the trial. So um, this held up well um, in terms of safety. So move on to the final part here and leave plenty of time for questions. Um, uh, I've been talking mostly about disease modifying therapy. Um, 
I, I do want to make a point that uh, there are some FAQs that come up in the management of these patients on the wards or uh, when patients present to the general neurology clinic, um, knowing that most of the time the disease modifying therapy questions are going to be referred to the, the neuroimmunology division here. So we'll start with a few uh, FAQs and reminders here. So first question, how do you treat NMO relapses? Um, Obviously we give steroids usually because that's the first thing available, but there really is a lot of evidence that says that plasma exchange is needed as soon as possible. There's actually a series of papers saying that the extent of recovery is really influenced by the timeliness of giving them plasma exchange. The common teaching for MS is that, uh, you know, it may hasten recovery, but it doesn't really affect the kind of long-term trajectory of uh, where patients are gonna end up. But um, that isn't necessarily the case for NMO. So for a patient that has a bona fide relapse, and I'm not talking about pseudo relapses or diagnostic um, uncertainty. If you have a patient and they're NMO positive and they're coming in with a legit relapse, it's really important to get them to plasma exchange as soon as possible. Another commonly asked question is, uh, do you need to follow the titers to monitor seropositive NMO? Short answer to that is that it doesn't seem necessary so far. Um, there's several good papers showing that um, although we need it for the diagnosis, there's not really a strong correlation between the antibody titers and relapse rates or um, uh, the, the severity of disability over time. Uh, third question here, uh, does the transverse myelitis have to be longitudinally extensive for it to be NMO? Uh, this is a key teaching point. Uh, it does not have to be uh, longitudinally extensive. Um, certainly, if it is longitudinally extensive, then that puts NMO squarely in your differential diagnosis, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, really, the utility of seeing longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis is that it's less likely to be MS. So in that case, you need to be thinking about um, NMO and uh, sarcoidosis and other things, but NMO can have short lesions, so don't be uh, uh, fooled by that or rule it out just because the lesions are, are short. And then... Uh, lastly here, uh, can you use MS treatments for NMO? Uh, generally, no. And that's despite the fact that uh, uh, NMO was thought to be a subtype of MS for all those years. And there have been some pretty good studies showing that uh, natalizumab, fengolimod, and interferon beta um, often are associated with worse outcomes and more relapses for NMO. Uh, I say all this with the one exception of B-cell therapies. So rituximab generally works for both, um, if not everything it seems these days, but in general, um, the other disease modifying therapy should not be used for NMO. So with that, it uh, looks like we're right up against time here. Um, uh, I wanna, again, thank everybody for the warm welcome to Duke here, um, especially all my colleagues in the uh, uh, Division of MS and Neuroimmunology. Appreciate uh, you guys uh, bringing me on board. Um, uh, a lot of the papers that you saw uh, referenced here were um, also uh, um, partly some collaborations and uh, uh, there's some mentorship from folks that I knew back at Hopkins and up at Brigham, so I want to thank them as well. And then there's several organizations that are doing a lot of good patient advocacy and research um, uh, funding work uh, related to NMO. So I just want to give a shout out to the Guthrie Jackson Charitable Foundation, uh, the Sumara Foundation, and uh, P. Corey, um, uh, which are really uh, great uh, contributors to this effort to try to uh, help people with NMO. So uh, I think we still have a decent amount of time, maybe five minutes or so for questions. So I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you, Dorla, as we all start to unmute. Uh, anybody with uh, questions, just uh, put your name or your question in the chat and we'll get it to Dorla. So Dorla, uh, two things. So first of all, Peter Agri, after he, uh, after he won his Nobel Prize at Hopkins, actually came to Duke for about three or four years as a, I think he was some kind of research dean, uh, and then went back up to uh, Hopkins. Uh, so here's something that's always flummoxed me. Of all the places you'd expect to find aquaporins would be in brain endothelial cells, but they don't have any. Uh, and the I've always wondered how does water get through the, the, uh, you know, the, the blood brain barrier and uh, without those being present? I mean, is there, are there other ways of water to get across cells aside from aquaporins? Uh, 
Good question. Um, and I don't have a straightforward answer to it. Sort of, uh, it's one of these things where I could certainly look up the answer there. I know with the aquaporin for um, aquaporins, I mean, they're all over the place. I know they're not the only means of water transport. I mean, in some cases, it's just um, kind of, you know, diffusion and osmotic pressure, but as far as sort of um, directed transport in and out of cells, that's a different story. Yeah. But they are in the glial cells right under the uh, endothelial right. cells. Yeah, it's just a, it's a right. mystery to me. Uh, Mike, Mike Lutz has a question. Oh, yeah. So um, it, it was a great presentation. It's interesting that you had um, three different molecular targets for the drugs, which seemed pretty far ranging to me from complement C5 to IL-6R and CD19. I was wondering if there, would there be a reason to expect one of those targets would be better from that list, just from knowledge of the pathways and whether a combination or some type of a, um, you know, an antibody cocktail would make sense? Great question, yeah. So um, in terms of, so is there a combination that could be better or is there one of these that could be better? That's, is that basically the question? Yes. Okay. So one, um, I think the combination question is interesting and in that just as a, um, a practice style, um, some of my rheumatology colleagues kind of uh, chuckle at uh, uh, us uh, neurologists in the sense that they've been using combo therapies for lots of different uh, conditions for a long time, but everyone's very skittish about doing um, uh, combination therapies for uh, neuroimmunology neuroimmunology because of concerns about PML and opportunistic infections and things like that. So as far as would it be theoretically feasible to do? Yeah, but I've seen a lot of folks be really skittish about trying that um, just for concern of the opportunistic infection aspect of it. And then as far as which one is better, um, uh, you know, we can look at the trials and it's sort of comparing uh, apples to oranges to pears and, and, and the different study populations here. But it's sort of just kind of working its way back up the tree uh, from complement back to the cells that are making the antibodies that will uh, incite the complement dependent cytotoxicity. Um, I don't know which one is best per se, but it does feel like um, in terms of the practicality, um, for example, eculizumab, you have to give every two weeks. Um, that's a real burden on patients to do that, um, that frequently to try to keep complement there. And do you do that forever? Um, it doesn't strike me as something that you would do for a lifetime to try to manage NMO, um, although certainly you might do it for a couple of years or so, depending on how active it had been in the past. Um, the CD19 uh, angle, um, that's basically like the CD20, just like uh, rituximab. That seems to have a little, a little bit better for longevity, but again, I guess really to, to answer your question, I don't I don't know which one is better per se from a number standpoint, but there hasn't really been a trial to, to demonstrate that. Um, but in terms of practicality, it, there is gonna be a bottleneck for um, what patients can actually get and for how long they can get it. Um, I, I think that's about it, Dorlin, and we're at 9.03, so... Uh... Got a bunch of excellence, uh, great talk and things of that sort. Anyway, uh, thank you very much, Dorlin. Welcome and everybody have a good, safe day. Thanks.